thanks very much for coming. Um, you have already the link, so if you want to evaluate this talk, uh, feedback is really appreciated. Um, my name is Jorge Salamero. That's my Twitter handle if you want to send me messages. Um, I work for Server Density, and if this talk gets boring at some point, you might want to read our blog, which is more entertaining than me. Um, as I said, I work for Server Density. We are a server and website monitoring company. Basically, we collect all the metrics from your servers, and we will let you know when something requires your attention. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not here today to talk about our product. It's, this is an old uh, spam uh, talk. I'm going to talk about something else. The talk is titled War Games or uh, DevOps Flight Training. Um, but you will see that it's, it's a more general discussion about how we or which processes we have implemented internally to handle the human side of things, how we do training, how we do incident management, all those processes uh, process in place that allows us to run that infrastructure required to monitor in over 100,000 servers that we do at the moment. But to get a little bit into context, um, here today we are seeing a lot of talks about DevOps, and DevOps is very trendy, not on the moment, but since a few years ago. But unfortunately, DevOps has been about the tools, about infrastructure automation, about configuration automation, about uh, continuous testing, continuous delivery, monitoring, hopefully with us, um, logs, error handling, even feedback, all, all everything has been about tools, tools, tools. You, use, you should use those tools, you should apply those philosophy, you adopt that culture, and that's it. But at the end, nobody has to look at the people doing DevOps. And humans are the ones running the systems. Well, not only running the systems, we do the initial design, we do the improvements when things need to be changed, we do the maintenance, upgrades when we need to deploy security fixes and things like that. And guess what? We are the ones fixing <laughs> the systems when they break. So if humans at the end, we are the responsible of every single infrastructure, why we are not considering humans as part of the infrastructure and issues in your team, in your humans, as part of your system I issues? We should have eventually some alert, like this DevOps guy is tired or he is sleepy today. That's a risk for your infrastructure. Because humans impact business. Um, Downtime, it's basically a loss of users, uh, reputation, and then revenue. And downtime is because system fails and people that they are not productive, that they are not fresh, that they are not ready, trained, uh, confident to get things fixed, uh, won't be able to solve issues as soon as it is expected. So. At the end, unhealthy team, unhealthy team members has a direct impact in your time, downtime, in your SLA, but also in your revenue, in your business. So that's important. Human risk or, hum or the thing of having humans running the systems is that we fail. We fail all the time. We sleep, we lapse, we make mistakes, we even do uh, wrong things on purpose. We do violations. And no matter what we do, this is going to happen again and again. They say that humans are the only animals that they step twice in the same stone. What can we do to handle this? How we can handle the human side of things? Well, we should prepare <coughs> to have downtime. It's completely unrealistic to say, well, you know what? I'm deployed on high availability across multiple zones. Uh, that's the perfect design with uh, across multiple infrastructure providers, whatever. Well, at the end, always something is going to fail. So you should be ready for that. You should train and you should practice how you are going to react and how you are going to respond as well to those incidents. Once everything is fixed, you should be looking at doing post-mortems because you always learn more from the mistakes. Although that's a different issue, or we don't have enough time today to cover that. Uh, so I'll focus on the first two points. And 
that's enough of theory. That's all beautiful, but uh, you will be asking yourselves and me as well. So what did you do to handle all that side of the humans running infrastructure? And I'm going to give you real examples today, real practices, things that we implemented. And probably a good example to start is one of our incidents we have a few months ago. I'm going to tell you a story, won't be long, I promise. Um, our infrastructure provider had a power failure in one of the data centers. Well, it's nothing really unusual. They should be prepared for that. So guess what? The first backup generator failed. Well, they have a second backup generator. It failed as well. And then in just one second, half of our infrastructure went down. That's a huge impact for our platform. And we couldn't like cope with all the metrics from all those thousands of servers that we are monitoring. So our solution basically went down. We got uh, an incident page, uh, and our engineer on call, he woke up, he saw what he had in front of him, and well, at the end, this is was something he was prepared to do it, at least in theory. We have a playbook, we have the instructions on how to recover from this situation. Unfortunately, it was required a manual failover. It was not, not a procedure automated because of some limitations of the infrastructure provider we were using. But, you know, the documentation was there. Actually, the documentation was even timed, so we knew how long was going to take us to recover from this. DNS manual failover, do some changes, 20 minutes. Well, at the end, when all this got fixed, we look at our downtime and we saw that we have 43 minutes. And we were asking ourselves, if we have trained, if we have the documentation, and if we have time, all these procedure, and it was supposed to take 20 minutes, from where those extra 23 minutes come from? They are the human factor. If you want to read the whole story, you can go to our public status page and read all the details. Um, so we have to learn from this uh, bad experience. By the way, now it's all automated, so even if that happens again, uh, the procedure won't require human intervention. But still, we wanted to um, learn from this. And we realized that the problem was the human factor, the person who actually received the uh, the incident page was not uh, ready enough to handle this. He was unfamiliar with the process. He had trained this once, he had the documentation, but you know what, you, when you create a company, you set up the DNS, and probably mm, you wouldn't change that never again. So in theory, everything was perfect, but in practice, it was something different. Then the second thing that happened is that imagine yourself, you wake up in the middle of the night and you realize that the whole product of your SaaS company is down. All your customers, they are without service. So you kind of panic because all the responsibility is on your shoulders. And in such situation, the most intelligent thing to do is to bring someone else in to help you. So he had to escalate this internally, which basically meant waking up another person, blah, 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 so at the end, there we go, those extra 23 minutes. So what do we can do to improve this? Well, we created what we call the general response process. And this is something we do every time there is an incident. Um, you will think every time you get an alert, what you do is start looking at what's wrong. Well, no, we do something else. We have this process. First thing you need to do is to acknowledge the alert. We are using PagerDuty um, to get our notifications, and first thing you need to do is to acknowledge the alert. So the rest of the team members, they know there is someone working on that. The second thing you do is to load incidents response checklist, something similar to this. And then you go into our chat. We use Slack, but you could be using anything else. And we have a special room only for incidents because 
If it's in the middle of the night, might be quiet, but if it's during the day, during office hours, the engineers, the front-end engineers, the marketing people might be like discussing other things in, in the chat, so we don't want to have like mixed conversations and noise around. So everything happens in a separate room. So if we need to bring in someone else, someone extra to the incident handling, they can quickly read all the backlog and catch up quickly. We not only do that, we not only have this uh, specific uh, chat room, also every action that is executed on the servers is logged into a Jira. This might be a bit of deduplication or duplication, but it's very useful to write post-mortems because you go to the Jira ticket, every incident also opens a Jira ticket, and you see everything has been executed with the timing and everything, so it's a good uh, summary uh, to write the final postmort. Once you have done all this is when you SSH into the system or you look at your monitoring or you start using your tools to troubleshoot to find out what's going on. Might be something super simple, a knowing issue that will take just 15 seconds to get fixed, but Nevertheless, we will be doing these all the time just to prevent because if at the end it's a very difficult thing that you need to bring five different people to get that fixed. If you didn't start this properly from the beginning, it will take much longer to, to catch up. Um, once you start troubleshooting and you find out what's the problem, uh, most probably we have documented how to resolve that situation. And for that, we use checklists. Checklists are just great. Actually, in the slide before, you just saw one. Um, and that's why this talk was called Flight Training for DevOps, because checklists, they are used everywhere. Checklists are very important because nowadays, infrastructure is very complex. And to be honest, nobody can handle all that complexity in our brains. We know that sysadmins and DevOps, we have big egos, and we consider that if we created that system, we know how to fix everything on that system. Well, guess what? If you wake up in the middle of the night, you are tired, you are hungover, or even drunk, or you are stressed, uh, you are it's not going to be the best of you, or if it's another colleague who needs to handle that incident, everything needs to be properly documented, and uh, that's very useful. And you know what? Checklists, they are used everywhere. Pilots, they use checklists, although they are flying like two or three times every day, and all the time they do the same testing before taking off, but they still have these huge books with loads of checklists. Doctors, when you are having surgery and they open you, they also have checklists with all the procedures, anesthesia, uh, things that they need to check, and also divers. I, I, I took my diving uh, training a few months ago, and one of the first things uh, they teach me was Bruce Willis runs all films, <coughs> which is basically checking all your gear when uh, you are on surface before going into the water. Because if you forget to do something and your gear fails, you will die. So in the same way that lives are critical, I think you are going to consider that your SLA and your uh, infra having your infrastructure running is going to be critical. So that's why we think using checklists are a good thing to do. But checklists, they shouldn't be followed blindly. That's why we have humans and hopefully smart humans using them. If there is something stupid, please don't follow. Uh, so be a little bit a uh, bit critic with your checklist. Otherwise, the process would be completely automated and we wouldn't have a, a human. Checklist, they need to be stored in an independent system. If you store your documentation in the same infrastructure, when your infrastructure goes down, guess what? Your documentation is gone as well. So use whatever you want. We use Google Docs. That sucks. Um, but, you know, it's there, available, everyone has logins already, uh, all the security measures for the documentations are in place, second factor authentication, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So, why not to use Google Docs? Should be searchable, uh, because these things, the documentation tends to grow, and when you are on a time-sensitive incident, that needs to be 
fixed as soon as possible. Searching is nice. Again, searching Google Docs sucks. So, uh, but yeah, that's what we use. And very good recommendation is always document known issues because something that happened, it's very likely to happen again. If not exactly the same, very similar. So if you got one of your colleagues writing good documentation about how to get that thing fixed, if you are waking up in the middle of the night and you can fix that in three minutes and then go back to sleep, you will be very thankful to that person. And well, it, writing documentation is enough. What we saw in the example I'm, uh, I mentioned, I showed you before, documenting it's not enough. You need to do training, and training needs to be as realistic as possible. And that's why we run our internal war games. Our internal war games, they are run every two months, between two weeks and two months. It really depends and how busy we are with other things, and how much our infrastructure has changed. We like to run those war games in an infrastructure or in a scenario that is as similar as possible to the production scenario. Nowadays, thanks to the cloud, this should be quite easy. You just spin new machines, you play with them, you get them break and fixed, and then you shut them down. Sometimes if you handle huge amounts of data, that's not realistic or that's expensive. So at least take that into account in your games because restoring a 5 megs database is not going to take the same amount of time that restoring 5 terabytes database. So it's a good thing that in your playbooks, you run the timing of each of the actions. So you know, oh, if I run this command, and it's going to return immediately or it's going to take five minutes. So that kind of thing, it's quite handy. But don't get scared about all the complexity of running war games because you could start straight away now during the lunch break. You could get your colleagues and start saying, hey, guess what? What if we broke this? How we would fix that? And you do a completely mock a scenario. It's not as perfect as running a clone or uh, a real scenario, but it's uh, still a good start. And also, something that we do, and it's very important, is to do multiple failures. When we design systems, we do high availability, we do resiliency, we put some measures in place to prevent downtime. So when you actually have downtime and you need to get things fixed, is because not because one thing failed is because multiple things fail at the same time that we didn't think of they could be failing together. And because of that, they are unexpected things. So in your war games, what or in our war games, what we do is to have one or two guys in our operations team breaking things completely randomly, completely unrelated to each other, and giving the, the rest of the team doing the actual training unexpected results. So if we break the database and then the guys fixing things, they go, oh, let's, okay, the database is broken, it's lost, let's go to restore it. Then uh, as they try to restore the database, the other guys, what they do? They remove the whole operating system. So they, so you go, you try to restart the service and they say, no, this is common not found. So what is this? Well, these are the kind of scenarios you should be training for and not like restoring a database because that actually should be automated. There are results. So, so we use um, checklists, we use documentation in the independent system, we do training. Um, how has this improved? Well, there are results. We are testing the individual and the team response time. So we know how fast we can fix things. We run real commands. So when you need to run this for real, you have made that before. And we see that we train the people, but we also train the procedures. So the documentation we got gets improved every time we run our round games. And we improve and train the tools, because if we need to run three commands, probably that will be automated and human results, because we, we wanted to handle the human side of things. 
we have seen that people on cold increase their confidence. So again, if you wake up in the middle of the night or while you were having lunch and you need to fix something and oh, yeah, I trained for this uh, yesterday. So you feel very confident and you reduce that panic effect. On complex incidents, when you need to bring multiple people working together, improves the coordination because if you <coughs> train just yourself um, and then you have a complex incident and you need to bring a colleague, maybe it's a new one or it's someone who's working in, in a different office, someone who you don't know that well. So once you do these war games internally, you increase the coordination, but also improves the trust relationship with your colleagues. So when, again, the time, uh, the, the incident is time sensitive, there is a pressure and you need to trust someone, will be good enough, will be able to fix that. So if you have trained that, you, you see those things imp improving. And at the end of the day, all we want is to improve time to resolution. We do this um, often, you should do this as often as possible um, because your infrastructure changes. So if you roll new code, you roll new services, uh, you have to run war games again uh, because you forget things change. And how many people from here remember everything they learn on their driving license? Probably none. Uh, I don't remember at least the, the all the details of everything because it's something you did once uh, many years ago and then you just drive. Well, that's why doing war games uh, is very important. What other things we can do in addition to war games? We should um, handle on call properly. Yes, there are multiple tools out there. For example, PagerDuty. Um, you need to take into account that people on call, even if they don't receive any page, they get very stressed and tired because you have that anxiety of, oh, I'm I am going to receive a page today or tonight. Is it going to be difficult to solve or will be nothing? You cannot rest. So even if you don't have any incident, your rest gets affected. And actually, um, if you have trouble to sleep, there are studies that they say that you lose a productivity of value on 7.8 days every year. And you also get burned because of that stress. So handling properly on call schedules is something that should take seriously. Again, also what kind of alerts you send your people, it's very important. Uh, we see that half of the interruptions humans do while working is because we get distracted with all things Facebook or Twitter. But if we have a monitoring system that's alerting that people all the time, there are again studies that say that it takes 23 minutes to get focus back on the task you were doing before. So that, per that team or those people on call, they won't be productive. So it's another thing. And all these theories and all these examples on how to improve things, uh, it's not something that we just do here in Cerebral Density. Uh, many companies with different sizes uh, they are doing. So we got together and we started to talk about this and we have decided to call it Human Ops because it's, it's inside of DevOps. Um, if you want to read more things about this, go to Human Ops. Uh, we had a meetup uh, just to talk about these things with Spotify, Barclays, gov.uk in London a few weeks ago, more than 100 people just talking about on-call incidents. So there is a huge interest to discuss these things and hopefully we'll be having another meetup uh, in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. So if you're interested, come in. Um, before I finish, um, sh that's a secret. If you want to get our server density free account, go to serverdensity.com slash conferences and put that code, you get a free package of two servers. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to I'll tell you today. This is also a very cool app that you should check out. That's my Twitter account if you want to send me any message or follow me or whatever. And again, the link so you can give feedback for this talk. And now I think we have a few, only a very few minutes for questions. So anyone?
Yes. Uh, what's the size of the team and when those programs actually happen, uh, which percentage of uh, the team is actually allocated and also the profiles? So I can imagine the developers, but there's also designers, there's mm -hmm. uh, project managers, program managers, etc. How incidents are handled, it's very different from company to company, product to product, or organization to organization. In our case, uh, we have an operations team of two, three people, plus the whole backend team, which is on call as well. So it's a combination of ops plus backend engineers. There is someone from front end as well on call, but they never got any page. Um, and in our case, it's, it's an incident. Usually it's one person who fixes the things. If he needs help, he brings in either a uh, second person from ops or back an engineer. So it's quite simple in our case. There are organizations that it's even more simple. Uh, for example, in the London Human Ops, we have the people from gov.uk, probably one of the biggest pages in the UK, at least the biggest governmental page. Most of their content is static. So they were telling us they only got seven alerts that they wake them up during the night because the rest of the things can wait until the next day. And there is just on a small team of people on call. <laughs> then we also have the people from Spotify that they do a completely different approach. The ops teams provide services to the developers and the ops teams handle incidents of the services while the developers handle incidents of the code of the application. So that really will depend on how is your product or your infrastructure or orchestrated, if you are using microservices, how your team works together, really depends. Another question? You say there are games. So your opponent is the two colleagues breaking the system or is there another team trying to fix the same problem? Um, ideally, we should have someone completely external, but they should know the infrastructure. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Etsy engineering team that have a very good DevOps blog, they published that they have written some piece of code that it was the Chaos Monkey that was breaking things randomly. We don't have um, Chaos Monkey in the office. So what we do is we assign one people, one person to break things, and then the rest of the team gets those things fixed. And that person usually rotates. Okay. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks very much.